talk a little bit about shepherds. Feel free to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to be reading from in just a minute. Um, So when you think of shepherds or sheep, shepherds, sheep comes to mind for me. And you know that in the Bible, sheep are mentioned more than any other animal. It's over 400 times. And shepherds are mentioned about 100 times. So it seems to be a popular thing. And, and I don't know if you've had much uh, opportunity to hang out with sheep. I know some of these guys in the front row have. But I, I got to spend a bit of time with them. And it makes a whole lot more sense when you work with sheep why we are mentioned as sheep in the Bible. Sheep are not very smart. And they're a pain to work with at times. And they don't go where you want them to. And uh, there's this one time we were trying to herd them. And they just only decided they wanted to go into a ball. They wouldn't go into the nice cozy shelter Instead of the storm, it was, it was quite amazing, but, but sheep in the Bible times were, they were quite important to the culture and to society and the economy. So sheep were very important. And, uh, when I was out west in Saskatchewan, my friend Travis, he worked on a sheep farm. He was going to school and he volunteered there and he took me along with him. And, uh, I, I was great. I always liked hanging out with Travis. He was, he was a fun guy. And, um, one thing you should know about me is that I'm very good at doing what I'm told. So we were walking around, inspecting the sheep, and all of a sudden, Travis says to me, Ah, that sheep's in the wrong place. Go grab it. Um, so, what do you think I did? I grabbed the sheep. Now, when you think of sheep, you think of these little itty-bitty ones, right? Well, this guy who Travis worked for had the giant ones. They were like Colombian sheep. That's what they were called. So I grabbed right around his middle. And he didn't like it. <laughs> and it took off. And with me being the experienced sheep herder that I am, that was the first time. I did go back a few times after this, but I hung on. <laughs> and you know, there's all sorts of nice things on the f- ground where the sheep live, right? <laughs> so I'm like hanging on, going through, and I found out in a hurry how messy it can be to be a shepherd. Um, we eventually got stopped when I got caught on a fence and I still didn't let go, uh, until Travis says, let's go, let go. And then he says, come here, sheep. And the sheep comes over. (laughs) Didn't even need me to do it. He just wanted to laugh. So, but yeah, I, I was a mess and I found out how messy it can be because in the Bible times, if you were a shepherd, you were not thought of very much. Uh, it was one of those jobs that people did because we needed they needed the sheep around, but it wasn't looked on very well. And the religious leaders or the Pharisees of the day, they had this list of jobs, and some of them were good jobs, some of them were bad jobs, and some of the bad jobs we were considered to be unclean. And if you were unclean, there was a lot of things you couldn't do. You couldn't go to the temple to worship. You couldn't go and uh, help people out in a court of law. Like if someone, if you saw somebody doing crime, you were not able to go be a witness because you were a shepherd. So being, they were thought of as liars and thieves, and they I mean they just lived in the fields all day, right? So people didn't like them very much. So that's that's what we're looking at when we look at the the uh, shepherds. So let's read from Luke chapter two, uh, verses eight to twenty. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Then the, when the angel had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all these things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. 
So, why did the angels appear to the shepherds? Because they needed to hear about Jesus. So sheep in those days weren't penned in like we have around here. They were free to roam. They lived on the fields. And I mean, I imagine for sheep, you yeah, living in the fields, wind blowing through your hair, not a care in the world, right? Until something wants to have a snack. So the shepherds were there to help protect the sheep, to keep them safe, to feed them, make sure that they were all looked after. And they did it in all sorts of weather. And I don't think they got weather like we get over in the Bible times. But they had to spend all night out with the sheep. And I can imagine, if, if you picture what's happening, so the sheep are out. I like the picture on the, I had up there earlier of the sheep lay, uh, shepherds laying down and there's a campfire in the middle. I imagine it was a bit like that. They were hanging out by a fire, probably telling stories. Nothing out of the ordinary, just a regular night. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up and tells them what's been going on. A spectacular display. I don't know, it's always interesting. Whenever an angel shows up, it always says, do not be afraid. It would be hard not to be, I think. But he tells them the gospel message. He tells them that the Messiah has come. And what great news. And I like what it says in verse 10. It is news for all the people to hear. So they were standing in awe. And then all of a sudden, the big choir bursts into their song. And I like their reaction to this. When the angels had left them, in verse 15 it says, and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us off, told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in the manger. So they hurried off, and they go find Mary. Now, it's always interesting when you read the birth of Jesus, how it was in a stable. I mean, he didn't start in a good way. And then all of a sudden... These stinky old liars and thieves, which people thought they were, come visit. How would you feel if the first people that came to visit your new baby were like that? You would have, we should think it would be the holy people or the religious people. I wonder who were the first people to come see uh, the prince and the princess's little baby that was born last year. Probably wasn't the, the people on the street. It was probably the royals, right? That's not the case here. And I, and I love this part of the story because even when Jesus is born, we see the message of why he came right from the beginning. It's so that all can come to know God. Starts with the shepherds. The shepherds are the first ones to hear. Mary learned firsthand why Jesus has come. Has he come to save the world? And we all, at one time or another, will have to face the facts. That we are separated from God, and we've done wrongs, and there's things in our life that are keeping us from that. Uh, We have lots of wrong stuff in our lives. It's easy to see when you match up with the Ten Commandments. So answer this in your head for me. Don't need to do it out loud. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever looked at someone with lust in your heart? The Bible tells us these things are all wrong. Matthew 5.21 says if we are angry or hate our brother, that's the same as murder. So we've kind of got like four commandments here, and I've failed. I don't know about you guys. Four looks like this, not this. And in 2 Corinthians, it says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive what is due to him, For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We need someone to help us. We need a savior. We need to search him out and find him. So think of this. uh, A vacationing family, they're driving on a summer day. The windows are down. All of a sudden, a giant bee flies in. It's not too bad of a big deal. Except for the little girl in the back seat is deathly allergic. If she gets stung, she could die within the hour. So, the little girl in the back seat starts just screaming, Daddy, 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 Daddy! And so the father pulls the car over and reaches around trying to catch the bee, get it out, out, of, out of the car. He can't quite catch it. So he grabs hold of the bee. And he just waits because he knows what's coming. He gets stung and in pain he opens his hand up and the bee flies away. 
Back into the car, a little girl starts screaming, Oh, daddy, 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 it's going to sting me. He says to his daughter, he says, No, it's not going to sting you. Holds up his hand, and the stinger's in his hand. The bee can't sting anymore, he says. It's okay. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Jesus says to us, Look at my hands. You will see the nail-scarred hand and realize that on your behalf, Jesus took the pain, he took everything, and he made a way for us to get to heaven. It'd be a sad night if all that happened, those shepherds hanging out by the campfire, and they missed it, if they, if they missed the birth of Jesus. But God wanted to include everyone in his plan, give everyone an opportunity. So the angels appeared to them because they needed to see Jesus. The people have been waiting a long time. The Old Testament talks all about the King coming, the Messiah coming, and now he's here. See, the shepherds were not important people. They were just regular, run-of-the-mill. But they weren't allowed to go to the temple to do worship because they were considered unclean. Could you imagine you have a job where you are raising sheep and lambs And those lambs are allowed to go to the temple, but you are not. They had an outside view of worship. They were not allowed to be included on going to worship God. I think it would have made the event so much more thrilling that they were told they were allowed to go and worship. And in verse 17 to 20, it says, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. And the shepherds, what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. So I kind of like it, like, think about the angel that burst into song after the first angel told the message. These guys burst into praise, telling everybody the good news. The shepherds went on a journey searching for a baby. Christmas is a great time where we can celebrate that journey. The next couple of weeks we'll be leading up to Advent, to to Christmas, to his birth, and we get to celebrate that. Let's get focused on him as we head down that road. Let's not forget about the mere reason for this season. I know it's hard when the snow comes and all the presents and the traffic is crazy out there. We need to remember the real reason for this. So let's head off to a restaurant. So we're the only family with a child in the restaurant. I sat Eric in a high chair and noticed that everyone else was eating quietly, silently to themselves. Suddenly, Eric squealed with glee and pounded his fist on the high chair. His fat baby hand makes a big noise. His eyes were crinkled with laughter. His mouth was bearing his toothless grin. He wriggled and giggled. I looked around and I saw the source of his merriment. It was a man whose pants were baggy, shirt was untucked, dirty-looking man. He didn't look like he shaved in a while, didn't look like his clothes had been washed in a long time. And we were too far from him, but I'm sure he smelled. His hands waved and flapped on his loose wrists. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you, Busta. The man said to Eric, my husband and I exchanged looks. What did we do? Eric continued to laugh and answer hi. Everyone in the restaurant noticed and was looking at us. This geezer, this old man, was creating a nuisance with my beautiful baby boy. A meal came and the man began to shout across the room, Do you patty cake? Do you do peekaboo? Hey, he knows peekaboo. Nobody thought the old man was cute. He was obviously drunk. My husband and I were embarrassed. We ate in silence, all except Eric, who was running through his repertoire of all of his fun, cute games. We ate in silence. And the old man continued to reciprocate every comment. We finally got through the meal, and we're getting ready to head for the door. My husband went to pay for the check, and I was to meet him in the parking lot. The old man sat poised between me and the door. Lord, Just let me get out of here before he speaks to Eric, I prayed. As I drew close to him, 
I turn my back to try to sidestep, to avoid breathing any of his air that he may be breathing out. As I did, Eric leaned over my arm, reaching with both of his arms, propelled himself into the old man's arms. Suddenly, a very old, smelly man and a very young baby completed their love and kinship. Eric, in an act of total trust and love, laid his head on the man's shoulders. The man's eyes closed, and I saw tears beneath the lashes. His aged hands, full of grime and dirt, rubbed my baby's back. No two beings have ever loved so deeply for such a short time. I stood in awestruck. The old man rocked and cradled him. His eyes opened and sat squarely on mine. He said in a firm, commanding voice, You take care of this baby. I said with a lump in my throat, I will. He pried Eric from his chest, lovingly and longly as though he were in pain. I received the baby. God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas present. I said nothing more than a muttered thanks. With Eric in my arms, I ran for the car. My husband was wondering why I was crying and holding Eric so tightly. Why I was saying, my God, my God, forgive me. I just witnessed Christ's love shown through the innocence of a tiny child who saw no sin, no judgment. A baby who saw a soul and a mother who saw a shirt. I was a Christian who was blind, holding a baby who was not. I felt as God was asking, are you willing to share your son for a moment when he shared his for all of eternity? The ragged old man had reminded me about the birth of his son and the gift he had. Let's not forget what Christ has done this Christmas. He went on a journey, started as a baby. He journeyed to the cross for us so that we don't have to be separated from God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you didn't just leave the shepherds sitting on the field by themselves that night. Thank you that even in your birth, we can see why you came. You came for everyone. Everyone can have a way to you. And we take time this Christmas to celebrate and remember who you are, and not just go through the motions, but really, truly give ourselves to you. We thank you for your amazing love. We pray this in your name. Amen.